Tonight, Israel under fire. Iran retaliates against Israel's consulate bombings with raining missile fire on the nation. Global tensions spiking as the world struggles to maintain its peace. India decides. First-time voters prepare to head to the polls as general elections loom ever closer. Modi on the prowl to bag yet another term. Trump on trial. The hush money witch hunt begins as Donald Trump prepares for a blow to his political future. And Happy New Year! Thailand celebrates the dawn of their New Year's with a splash as week-long festivities get along. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you very much for tuning in. You're joining us on World News Tonight. We at World News wish you a very happy and prosperous new year ahead. We have a lot to get you updated on with the start of the week. And we're starting off with the latest developments on the Israel-Iran tensions now. Now, according to officials, President Joe Biden warned Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that the U.S. will not take part in a counter-offensive against Iran, an option that Netanyahu's war cabinet favored after a mass drone attack and missile attack on Israeli territory. U.S. President Joe Biden and other leaders of the G7 nations condemned Iran's attack on Israel on Sunday, saying it risked provoking an uncontrollable regional escalation. Meanwhile, Netanyahu reconvened a war cabinet meeting in Tel Aviv to discuss a response to the drone and missile attack. War cabinet minister Benny Gantz warned that Israel would, quote, exact the price from Iran in a fashion and timing that is right for us. Iran's armed forces chief said the operation was considered successful and, quote, deemed the matter concluded. But Iran warned Israel and the U.S. that a retaliation to its overnight attack would elicit a far bigger response. The Israeli army released footage on Sunday that it said showed its fighter jets intercepting unmanned aerial vehicles and cruise missiles launched from Iran. The more than 300 missiles and drones mostly launched from inside Iran caused only modest damage in Israel, as most were shot down with the help of the U.S., the U.K., and Jordan. An Air Force base in southern Israel was hit but continued to operate as normal and a seven-year-old child was seriously hurt by shrapnel. There were no other reports of injuries or serious damage. Despite the minimal damage, Barbara Slavin, a distinguished Middle East fellow at the Stimson Center, called the attack on Israel a paradigm shift. The shadow war between Israel and Iran is now out in the open. But given that, Iran did it in a very calibrated way sending these slow, low fly, these slow drones, hours and hours flying from Iran to, uh, to Israel, giving plenty of time for the Israelis and the United States and others to prepare. I mean, even the Jordanians shot down a bunch of these drones as they went over Jordanian airspace. Uh, thank God no one was killed. Uh, it doesn't appear that there was very much damage. So it was kind of performative. Um, but it was nevertheless a paradigm shift because it was a direct Iranian retaliation on Israel for Israeli attacks on Iranians. Iran's attack was over a suspected Israeli strike on its consulate in Syria that killed top military commanders. It also followed months of clashes between Israel and Iran's regional allies, triggered by the war in Gaza. The threat of open warfare erupting between Iran and Israel and dragging the United States into it has put the region on edge. It also triggered calls for restraint to avoid further escalation from global powers including Russia, China, France, and Germany, as well as Arab nations, Egypt, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. Turkey also warned Iran it did not want further tension in the region. And due to the conflict, global airlines face disruptions to flights after Iran's missile and drone attacks on Israel further narrowed options for planes navigating between Europe and Asia. Iran's attack on Israel has ramped up tensions across the Middle East. It's also sparked chaos for the world's airlines. The attack by more than 300 drones and missiles prompted carriers to cancel or reroute many flights. 
Big names affected include Qantas, United Airlines and Air India. Over the weekend, Germany's Lufthansa said it was suspending flights to many destinations in the region. Researchers at Ops Group, which monitors airlines and airports, say it's the biggest single disruption to the air travel industry since the attack on the World Trade Center in 2001. Now avoiding Iran is a major headache for airlines flying between Europe and parts of Asia. They will have to reroute via Turkey or Egypt. However, some restrictions imposed after the attacks have now been lifted. Israel, Jordan, Iraq and Lebanon have all resumed allowing flights over their territories. Major carriers in the region, including Emirates, have since said they will resume operations. What isn't known yet is whether the unrest will hit demand for air travel. It has so far remained robust, despite the conflicts in Ukraine and Gaza. Moreover, in our local region now, nearly 18 million first-time voters are set to cast their ballots in India's general election to be held over almost seven weeks from April 19th onwards, where Prime Minister Narendra Modi will seek a record equaling third straight term. Days before voting began, Modi showcased a manifesto that promised to create jobs if he wins. That may be what young voters like 22-year-old Yashraj Singh want to hear. Singh is a student and hip-hop dancer who moved to bustling New Delhi for better opportunities. And he wants a government that understands his struggle. Official data shows nearly 16% of India's urban youth between 15 and 29 stayed unemployed in 2022 to 2023 due to poor skills or a lack of quality jobs. Away from the bustle of the capital in the village of Surana, Aman Yadav's priorities in the upcoming vote look a little different. The 19-year-old has been working his family's land for as long as he can remember. He wants a government that appreciates the hard labors of farmers. Surveys of families in rural areas earlier this year showed their income has grown stagnant or gotten worse compared to before the pandemic. A majority of India's population live outside its cities. And in a 2011 census, those areas employed half of its workforce. The general election will be held in seven stages until June 1st. Votes are due to be counted on June 4th and results expected the same day. And now North Korea's ties with the rest of the world continues to see upsets as major global powers make their own means of connecting with the nuclear dictatorship. With the latest of these being China with the visit of the top Chinese diplomats to the nation's capital. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un met with China's third highest ranking official Zhao Leji on Saturday and discussed boosting Pyongyang-Beijing ties. Kim and Zhao also had lunch together, according to the regime's official newspaper, Rodong Shimun, which came as since Thursday, and the meeting with Kim came on the last day of the visit. Kim also had lunch with Zhao, according to the regime's official newspaper, Rodong Shimun, on Sunday. South Korea's unification ministry said on Monday that Pyongyang and Beijing are trying to show their close relationship through this visit. The government added that any country, when interacting with North Korea, must abide by the UN Security Council resolutions. Now there's sorrow in Australia following a fatal outburst of one individual that caused many lives to be lost. Australia's Prime Minister Anthony Albanese laid floral tributes at a Sydney shopping centre after a man fatally stabbed six people the day before. An attacker who fatally knifed several people in a Sydney mall was shot dead by police in Sydney's beachside suburb of Bondi on Saturday, police said, as hundreds fled the scene. Rees Colmenares, an eyewitness who hid in a hardware store with 20 others, said she saw a baby wing taken to an ambulance. Oh, the mother was, was terrified. And people were coming out and screaming, like, stabbing, stabbing. According to the police, the assailant was shot by a police officer after he attacked shoppers in the busy Westfield Bondi Junction shopping centre. Emergency services were called to the mall just before 4pm local time after the stabbing reports. He looked like that he was on the killing spree on this side because when we come downstairs, there was another two bodies near the wedding area, near the wedding shop inside. It looked like they must have been stabbed. Two other witnesses taking shelter in a jewellery store told they heard shots fired and said they saw a woman lying on the ground. Several others, including a child, were taken to hospital, according to an ambulance spokesperson. Australia has some of the world's toughest gun and knife laws and attacks such as the one on Saturday are rare. 
but going in for a short commercial break now. We'll be right back with more key global updates. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back. We're continuing with updates on Trump's legal troubles. The trial is upon us. As Trump prepares for a verdict on his hush money scandal, it remains to be seen exactly how the ruling will affect his political future. Donald Trump has entered the courtroom. He was seated at the defense table, crossing his fingers over each other. Trump will make history today as the first former president to stand trial on criminal charges. A watershed moment for American politics, the presidential election and Trump himself. Trump, the presumptive Republican nominee for president, is required to be present for the entire trial, which could last as long as eight weeks. In brief remarks to cameras set up inside the courthouse, Trump said that the trial is an assault on America and just an attack on a political opponent. The DA's office and Trump's attorneys are now debating allowing the testimony of Karen McDougall and Dino Sajudin. Trump attorney Todd Blank argues that including discussion of McDougall's arrangements with AMI, which own the National Enquirer, is not part of the charges against Trump. And on the road to the White House tonight, multiple new polls show Joe Biden strengthening slightly in the U.S. presidential election, but suggest that third-party candidates could present a risk to his chance of carrying the White House in November. For more on this, we have other than the world news, special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Suzanne, what's the situation right now? And Rally, according to a poll released on Saturday, Biden has whittled down the four-point lead Donald Trump held in February with Trump leading Biden 46% to 45% among registered voters. Despite the narrowing of Trump's lead that the New York Times poll found, the survey located a worrying issue for Democrats. Some voters recalled Trump's 2016-2020 presidency despite his capacity to sow di divisiveness and chaos as a time of economic prosperity and and strong national security. Meanwhile, a dozen U.S. news outlets have called on the presumptive U.S. presidential nominees to commit to taking part in TV debates ahead of November's election. The statement did not name Joe Biden or Donald Trump, but said that it was never too early for candidates to publicly declare that they will take part. The letter warned that the stakes of his this year's polls were exceptionally high. Trump, who skipped all four Republican primary debates, has said that he is keen to debate President Biden. Anradi, we will have to wait and see whether a debate will ever come into fruition. Over to you. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. And now updates on the war in Ukraine. The head of Ukraine's military has warned that the battlefield situation in the east of the country has significantly worsened in recent days. Fierce battles are ongoing in several villages in the eastern Donbass region. For updates on the ground, we have Abdurna World News Special Correspondent Simashi Pereira from Moscow in Russia. Simashi. Yes, Anuradi. General Alexander Siskai said Russia was benefiting from warm weather, making terrain more accessible to its tanks and making tactical gains. It comes as Germany said it will give Ukraine an extra Patriot missile defense system to fend off air attacks. Battles have raged for control of Bodhanka, a village west the devastated city of Bakhmut. Ukraine officials say a slowdown in military assistance from the west, especially the US, has left it more exposed to aerial attacks and heavily outgunned on the battlefield. Despite repeated assurance that he is dedicated to Ukraine's defense, US House Speaker Mike Johnson have failed to advise a new military aid bill. The Democratic-controlled Senate passed fresh funding in February, which included $60 billion in aid for Kyiv. But the conservation Republicans in the House objected to the bill as it did not include funds for border security. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Simashi Pereira from Moscow in Russia. Thanks again. 
And we have some tech updates now. The tables have turned. Apple's smartphone shipments dropped about 10% in the first quarter of 2024, hurt by intensifying competition by Android smartphone makers aiming for the top spot. Apple has lost the title of world's top phone maker, overtaken by Samsung. That's according to figures out over the weekend from research firm IDC. It estimates Apple phone shipments dropped about 10% over the first quarter of this year. That saw its market share slip to 17.3%. The iPhone maker appears to be suffering as rivals step up competition. South Korea's Samsung launched new flagship models over the period, driving a strong rise in sales. Its market share rose to almost 21%. China also looks like a problem for Apple, with industry experts estimating its sales there were down by almost a quarter in the first six weeks of the year. Some companies and government agencies are restricting use of its phones in the country over national security concerns. Those moves mirror US government restrictions on Chinese apps on security grounds. Local brands are also upping their game. Xiaomi is now closing in on Apple in third place, with over 14% of the global market, while Huawei is gaining ground too. Its latest flagship phones have been hailed by Chinese media as a triumph over US sanctions on the firm. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. Well, just as we celebrated Singhala and Tamil New Year's, Thailand did their own celebrations. Thai locals and foreign tourists were being splashed and sprayed with water in the streets of Bangkok as the Southeast Asian country kicked off its annual Songkram festival, ushering in the Thai New Year. Celebrators, a considerable number drenched, strolled along the half-kilometre stretch of Bangkok's bustling touring centre Khao San Road as they joyously discharged water guns and danced to the tunes emanating from the roadside establishments. The Songkran holiday, marking the Thai New Year, will span from five days from April 12th to the 16th. The beloved ritual was included in the representative list of the Intangible Cultural Heritage of Humanity by UNESCO in December of 2023. And finally, some hopeful news tonight. Restoration workers and artisans are racing to finish the work of a lifetime to reconstruct Paris's Notre Dame Cathedral five years after the major blaze that ravaged the iconic monument. On April 15, 2019, a major fire broke out at the cathedral. The roof burst into flames, engulfing the spire and almost toppling over the main bell towers. The day is still seared into the minds of Parisians. But the scaffolding, which has surrounded the cathedral's facade since the start of reconstruction, is slowly disappearing, and a public reopening is in sight. Some 500 workers have helped restore the monument. Emma Roux is one of them. The stained glass artisan was first called to help remove Notre Dame stained glass windows. The stint then grew into restoration work. She calls their efforts the work of a lifetime. Notre Dame officials say the cost so far has been over $587 million and, thanks to massive donations, there will be money left over to keep investing in the building. It remains unclear what exactly caused the fire. French authorities have said an electrical fault or a burning cigarette may have been responsible. The reopening is scheduled for December and is currently running on schedule, according to the official leading the project. Well, five years ago, all hope was lost, only to be reborn like a phoenix at the Notre Dame. Well, that's all the stories we've got to report to you on World News tonight. Join us again next time for more updates from across the globe. Till then, good night.